Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. It's good to have another opportunity to come into the house of God with you and to worship with you tonight. Would you stand with us and sing with us tonight?
Okay, she's really, really troubled. The, the devil's fighting her every way he can.
will provide for us, God. We pray for answers every day, God. We pray for healing every day, Lord. We pray for you to touch people who have cancer, God, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We pray, God, that you would give peace in situations that are not peaceful right now, that they need calm, God. We pray right now that you would move into those storms, God, and that you would just calm them with your spoken word. In the name of Jesus right now, we pray for continued healing, God, in people's lives, God. Like Ashley, Lord, we know that you would just uh, touch her so many times, God, and that you're going to continue to do so, Lord. We pray for those people who are having surgery, God. We know that you are the master, that you are the doctor, God, that you guide the hands of the physician, Lord, that you put that talent into, Lord. So right now we pray, God, that you would just do so. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we pray, God, that right now you would give peace to people who need it. God, that you would deliver people who are bound by addiction, God, and things that are holding them down and keeping them from you, God, and keeping them from having the healing that they need right now. God, we lose healing in this place, and we bind addiction, and we bind those things that would break us down and tear us up, God. We pray right now, Lord, that you would just give us strength, God. Those of us who face mountains too big to climb sometimes, Lord, on our own, God, but you can give us the strength, God, to do it. In Jesus' name, God, if you won't remove a mountain, God, you will get strength to climb it in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, God. I pray for peace for those who have lost loved ones, God. I pray that you would just give them peace in their storm, God, in their time of loss, in their time of need right now. As they reach out to you, God, I pray that you would help them, God. In Jesus' name, God, I pray for Puxico right now. And I pray for each person, God, that they would be able to reach their community in the name of Jesus, God. By your spirit, Lord, we pray that we would be able to reach out and reach somebody and, and bring them to you, God. A lost soul would be saved because of your mercy, God, and your grace in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We worship you. And we thank you, God, because we can bring these needs to you and we can trust you with them, God. We can walk out of this place with a burden lifted off of our shoulders tonight. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We worship you tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah.
as we go into our classes at this time that we're going to continue to get what we need and what we came for in this place tonight. And if you're going to join us and celebrate recovery, we're going to go downstairs tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God bless you tonight, each and every one of you. As we're transitioning here, I love to see the traffic, the aisles full. As we're transitioning into our class time tonight, what a blessing. What a great group tonight for Celebrate Recovery and Youth Class. We're so thankful for each of you. And I'm thankful for you here in our class tonight. As we get ready to get into the Word of the Lord, I want you to look at Isaiah chapter 58 with me. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 1 through 8. And it says, Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice, they take delight in approaching to God. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast ye you find pleasure and exact all your labors. Behold, you fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. Is it such a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I have chosen? Notice this, to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free and that ye break every yoke. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house, when thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh? Then, everybody say then. then. He said, then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee, the glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. What I want to talk to you about tonight that I felt on my heart now for over a week uh, for this class is uh, this thought, why we do what we do. Why we do what we do. In these scriptures that I just read to you, the Lord began to answer his people and, you know, we can be God's people and not be doing what is pleasing to the Lord. That's right. Amen. There is a such thing as being wavered, as being prodigal. And I think sometimes, even as people of God, we become cold uh, in the Lord. And uh, we're not quite doing his will. But yet, as this scripture said, he said, your delight is in approaching me. You love the fact that you have this connection with me. And even when you're not where you're supposed to be and you're not doing what you're supposed to do, there's just something about that that, that you still uh, like to seek me and know my ways, um, even as if you were doing everything, dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's. And so the Lord began to say here, um, as you are fasting and as you're doing all the routine and the ritual and the disciplines, yet your heart has begun to depart. And just stick with me. I'm going somewhere here. I'm not here to beat up on anybody tonight. Um, but he basically was saying, you have lost sight of the purpose that you're supposed to be doing these things for. And so he began to tell them, um, why is it, or ask them, why is it that you fast? Why is it that you put yourself through this? Is it to twist my arm? Is it to try to convince me to do something that you don't think that I want to do? Um, 
And he said, that's not what the purpose of it is. And so he began to tell them the purpose of it all is to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke, to minister to those who are hungry, to those who are poor. And he said, if you'll do those things, then you're going to see blessing as a natural uh, product of doing the will of God. Does anybody believe that tonight? Um, I just felt like that we need to warn ourselves from time to time of the danger of becoming like the people of God during that time period who were no longer true worshipers of God, but they had come to a place where they were worshiping or they were serving the process or the approach instead of worshiping the God of the process that they were supposed to be approaching. You know, back in the 90s, I remember it very well. I was a music director in the 90s, a bad time to be a um, music director because it was that time that now, looking back, um, pretty much in all denominations, they talk about it. I've even read articles about the worship wars, the praise wars. And it was during that time that there was this huge transition going on. I know in, in Pentecostal and charismatic churches especially, but... Uh, it even affected other denominations who were very, very traditional in their worship. If you drive by uh, many churches today, you'll see 930 come to our traditional service. At 11 o'clock, come to our contemporary worship service, which basically means uh, we're going to do a greater vision stuff at 11 o'clock. But, you know, the thing is, greater vision might just pull out a, a song from the hymnal. If I feel like singing that, we're going to sing it, right? Um, because the truth of the matter is, and we all have to learn, is that it is not the approach. It is not the, um, the process that we're worshiping. We're worshiping the God of the process. We're worshiping uh, the God who we are approaching, uh, not not worshiping what we're doing, but worshiping him. But this became quite a, a stumbling block and a, a point of contention. Um, are we going to sing the new songs of the old? Are we going to hold the hymn book in our hand? Are we going to read the words off of the wall? Um, what are we going to do? And this is just one example that I think, you know, most of us have kind of moved past that, and, and, um, and it's not quite as sensitive of a subject now. But it's an illustration of allowing the way that we worship to become sacred. Okay, the method to become the sacred thing instead of who is supposed to be the object of our affection. So we have to remember why that we do what we do. This is what the Israelites' problem was. They forgot the purpose for the fast. They begin to think, well, the fast is something to get God to do what we want him to do. So we'll afflict ourselves. We'll make him hear us. Right? That's what they said. And God said, that's not the way that it works. You're not going to twist my arm and make me do something that I probably already want to do for you. But the fasting, you've got to get the purpose right. The worship, you've got to get the purpose right. Uh, the activities of the church, you've got to grasp a hold of the purpose of why we do what we do in order for it to be effective. What we, why we do what we do is to accomplish God's mission of healing and reconciliation for lost humanity that has been broken by sin. That is why we do what we do. In the New Testament, it says that we have been given this ministry of reconciliation. Uh, God was in Christ to do what? To reconcile the world unto himself. Okay? Why is Christ in us? To reconcile the world to God. We have this ministry of reconciliation, and everything that we do must flow from our understanding of that holy purpose. Freeing souls from the bondage of, of sin and oppression is why that we do what we do. In some way, in some shape, in some form, 
everything that we do has to come back to that. You mean everything? Yeah, I mean everything. Sunday school classes are not so just so we can babysit someone's kids while they enjoy the service. It's nice that they, they can enjoy the preaching without that distraction perhaps, but that's not why we do it if we're eliminating the distraction for the parents. Why are we doing that? So that they can receive what they need because their soul is important. Why is the child in the Sunday school class not be babysitting because they need to hear the word of the Lord on their level? Why is there children's church tonight? Because what I'm saying right now would just go right over the top of their head, but a puppet or a children's song will minister to them on their level. Why is there a youth class? Because we want to see souls saved. We want to see our youth saved. And we want to see them be turned into evangelists to win their friends. At the end of the day, everything that we do must be about souls. Why do we have home groups? It's about souls. Amen. It's about souls. If you can get someone to come to a home group that's never been inside the doors of the, of the church and even just introduce them to a body of believers that will pray with them right. uh, in, that, in that setting or just uh, spend time with them and, and listen to uh, them and, and, and learn about their lives, about what is important to them, learn uh, what's going on with them and let them know that they have a friend and someone that they can confide in and talk to. These things are important today. But we don't do it just to have something else on the schedule. We do these things. Why we do it is because there are souls that are going to spend eternity somewhere. And we must reach them. Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, as Jesus stood up and began to open the book and began to declare the word of the Lord, he declared his purpose, and it sounds very similar to what... Uh, what the Lord said in the Old Testament to his people as they were disappointed in the results of their fasting efforts. This sounds very similar. When he began to say, well, this is the reason that, that you do it. It's to deliver the oppressed. It's to let the bound go free. It's to minister to the poor and to the needy. This is why we do what we do. Why do I play bingo at um, Mingo RCF on Thursdays? Because it gives me an opportunity to connect with somebody and teach them a Bible study. Amen. Okay? So it's because those folks have souls just like everyone else that we're attempting to reach. And everything that we're putting our hands into, the, uh, the nursing home ministry here in town uh, that Sister Beth and some others are, are reaching into, is so very important to the Lord because the Word of God tells us that this is true religion. Right? right? What is true religion? To visit the fatherless, to visit the widows in their affliction, to, to minister to those who maybe will not be able to bless you in return or do anything that you might feel significant for you or for the church. Amen. But the Lord promises this. Let's go back to that scripture. We'll get to Luke in just a second here. Verse 8. He said, then. Everybody say, then. then. If we want to see great revival, great change in our church, in our community, in our families, it will happen when, when we have uh, dealt our bread to the hungry, when we have uh, ministered to those who are without, uh, when we have ministered to those in verse 6 who have been bound by chains of darkness. Uh, we've lifted the burdens off of them. We've let the oppressed go free. We've allowed the anointing of God flowing through us to break every yoke in their life. That's the purpose of it. And he said, Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and your health shall spring forth, and righteousness shall go before thee, and the glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. I want you to remember that last phrase. The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. Amen. Now let's look at uh, Luke chapter 4 as Jesus got up and began to declare his mission. He said this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because. Everybody say, because. because. Jesus is going to tell us here, this is my purpose. This is why I came. Now others, in other places, we would see it said that he came to see that which was lost. Over and over again. We'll see that he was moved with compassion to those who were like sheep without a shepherd. And he mourned in those situations and he cried over wept over Jerusalem and said I would have gathered you under my wings 
just like the, the, the uh, uh, chicken gathers her uh, babies under her wings. God has that uh, desire to reconcile the world, to bring us all uh, to him. Amen. That's why he said that the Son of Man didn't come into the world to condemn the world. The world doesn't need any more condemnation than it's already under. Right. When people react to you the way that they do adversely, as a Christian, you know why they do that? It's because they're condemned already. You don't have to condemn them. Right. If they're in the presence of people who are righteous, uh, if they see uh, someone living for God, their heart condemns them. They may fight back at you just because even if you've not said anything to them, uh, you've not talked down to them, you haven't talked condescendingly to them, uh, still yet they're going to feel that condemnation that comes from the enemy that tells them you're no good and they may act out toward you uh, negatively because of that feeling. But Jesus said that wasn't the purpose that I came for. I didn't come to condemn them. And we didn't come to just tell people all day long how bad and how evil that they are. But we come to tell them there is a Savior and there is hope for you. All right. Amen. That's our purpose. And so Jesus said, this is the because. He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. So why do we do what we do? It's to get people back into a place, do everything we can to help them to get in a place where they can be reconciled to God, that his will can be done in their lives, that they would know that they've been bought with the price of sinless blood and that God loved them so much. The word of God tells us hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. Right. Amen. Aren't you thankful for that today? Aren't you yeah. thankful for what God has done Amen. in your life? Amen. So we don't have to have that mentality that we're going to twist God's arm as if he doesn't want to help and bless and but maybe he'll just give in if we apply enough uh, pressure to him. That was the attitude that we talked about here in verse 3 and 4. They said, wherefore we fasted and, and you don't see uh, what we're doing. We've afflicted our soul and, soul and you take no knowledge of us. But God answered them and said, behold, in the day of your fast you find pleasure and exact all your labors. Behold, ye fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. He said, uh, you're ignoring the purpose of it. Right. Do we understand that when we fast, and from time to time, pastor calls a fast, but you know what the best kind of fast is for you to feel moved um, to draw closer to the Lord, and that's really what it's about. Sometimes I need to be changed in order for somebody else to be changed. Right. I need to be changed so that my testimony will impact someone else. Not the testimony of how many days I fasted and how many meals I gave. No, no. To, to sharpen my witness, my testimony, that I truly am a servant of God. If I'm close to him, people are going to sense that when I talk to them. They're going to feel God's presence if I'm in tune with him. Right. And they're going to know uh, that, I am, uh, that I belong to him and that I can get in contact with him on uh, their behalf. So when we're not aligned with God's purpose, we cannot expect God to bless our efforts. Our motives and desires have to be one with his plan. None of this trying to convince God to bless my plan, right? But letting my desires become one with what he already wants to do. Good results can be expected when we want what God wants and work for what he wants. I want to say that again. Good results can be expected when we want what God wants and work for what he wants. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, you could all quote it. If my people, 
which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then, everybody say then. Amen. He said, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Our land needs healing. Yeah. It seems like just every other day somebody's uh, picking up a gun and just randomly shooting whoever's in the supermarket or whoever. If you feel like that you're safe today, well, you're probably under some kind of a false illusion. I'm talking about just when you go out uh, about your business. Um, we was in a mall in St. Louis here a couple weeks ago with, with the youth group. And um, I was talking to my wife later. I said I was sitting there in the mall, and I said it, it's, it's terrible. Uh, there we were in South County, but you're suspicious of everyone. And I said, I'm just sitting there waiting for the girls to come out of a store. And I'm just sitting there, and, and I see some people walking toward me uh, across the way there. And my first thought, I thought, I wasn't just fearful of them, but just because of everything happening in the world, you know. And um, I thought, what would I do if that guy uh, had a, a gun and just started shooting right now? And I started thinking, what would I do? You know, what would I do? Would I, would I pick up this uh, little sofa and throw it at him? Would I dive under it? What, what could I do to protect myself? That's the kind of world that we are living in, and our land needs healing. But you know where healing comes from? The healing comes from under the altar, the water that issues forth from the house of God and Amen. flows out into the desert places. That's where the healing's at. Right. So the people of God, we've got to understand that here we have this ministry of reconciliation. We have that living water that will heal our land. And if we will humble ourselves, right. prepare ourselves. That's what it's about, preparing ourselves. That's what prayer and fasting is. It's preparing ourselves by humbling ourselves and seeking the face of God, not to make God do something, but to get us in a place that we can be used as his vessels, as his conduits of healing and as his vessels of his saving power we can we can disseminate that to our world if we're where we need to be with God and so that's the vision you know that's the vision for what God wants to do through us we've got to understand the purpose and we've got to understand who we are and from time to time we talk about this mission of the church what is our vision for what God called us to do? But you know what's just as important or even more important than talking about it? It is how do we implement that vision? How do we actually do the things that God has called us to do? The church is built by what we do in between Events. Everybody do some air quotes. Say so special events. Special events. It'd be nice if the church could be built off of special events. It'd be nice if we could build the church off of a Sunday service with a guest speaker. It'd be nice if we could build the church off of, of um, uh, monthly uh, gatherings um, of our families in our in the in the forms of our home groups, even those are basically special events. They're not things that we do all the time, but they're special things that we do as a church body, and they have a purpose. But the church is built in the in between. In the days leading up, when I'm thinking that neighbor, I wonder if I could get them to come to my home group. That. That person that I work with, I wonder how I could minister to them today. Okay, See, that is implementing the vision that we hear about in the special service or that we get a taste of, a foretaste of, of what God wants to do when one person receives healing. That's not intended to be the sum total of it all, but it's intended to be uh, something to let us know what God already desires to do and what he will do in greater measure when we allow ourselves to be used of him. So we're wanting to build something great for God. And you know, special things can get done 
the special events can be done even if our motives or desires are not pure and kingdom focused. And you know why we can do special things even if our motives and desires are not up to par? Here's, I'm going to say something really deep here. Are you ready for it? It's because they're special things. We all like special things. Amen? There's an element of appeal to things that are special because the special is recognized and built up and there's a tension surrounding it. Uh, but to actually implement a vision, there has to be a sense of dedication and an abiding commitment to the purpose. So I want to show you something here. It's going to be our uh, longest passage here tonight. I'm going to hurry because this is a one and done. I don't have uh, two weeks to teach this, this lesson. Second Chronicles chapter 2, verse 1 through 18. 1 through 18. You believe I can do this in 15 minutes? Oh, ye of little faith. And Solomon determined to build a house for the name of the Lord and a house for his kingdom. And Solomon told out threescore and ten thousand men to bear burdens and fourscore thousand to hew in the mountain and three thousand and six hundred to oversee them. And Solomon sent to Huram the king of Tyre, saying, As thou didst deal with David my father and didst send him cedars to build him a house to dwell therein, even so deal with me. Now, Look at verse 4 through 6. This is Solomon's vision statement. He is casting his vision to Huram, the king of Tyre. He said, this is what I purpose to do. I build a house to the name of the Lord my God to dedicate it to him, to burn before him sweet incense and for the continual showbread and for the burnt offerings morning and evening on the Sabbath and on the new moons and on the solemn feast of the Lord our God. This is an ordinance forever to Israel. And the house which I build is great, for great is our God above all gods. But who is able to build him a house, seeing the heaven of heaven of heavens cannot contain him? Who am I then that I should build him a house, save only to burn sacrifice uh, before him? So Solomon states, this is my vision. I'm going to build something for God. I know I can't do it, could never do it justice. But I'm going to do everything I can to let the world know how great he is and to build up his name in the earth. But now in verse 7, he moves on from the vision to how the vision will be implemented. He says, send me that now, therefore a man cunning to work in gold and in silver and in brass and in iron and in purple and crimson and blue and that can skill to gray with the cunning men that are with me in Judah and in Jerusalem who David my father did provide. Send me also cedar trees, fir trees, and algum trees out of Lebanon, for I know that thy servants can skill to cut timber in Lebanon, and behold, my servants shall be with thy servants, even to prepare me timber in abundance, for the house which I am about to build shall be wonderful great. Verse 10, And behold, I will give to thy servants the hewers that cut timber, 20,000 measures of beaten wheat, and 20,000 measures of barley, and 20,000 baths of wine, and 20,000 baths of oil. Verse 11, Then Hiram the king of Tyre answered the writing, which he sent to Solomon, because the Lord hath loved his people, he hath made the king over them. Hiram said, Moreover, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, that made heaven and earth, who have given to David the king a wise son, endued with prudence and understanding, that might build a house for the Lord, and a house for his kingdom. And so Hiram replies back to Solomon and he says, I receive your vision. I am on board with what you purpose to do. I want to be a part of it. So now Hiram says, I will be part of the vision. I believe in it. That's what we say when we unite with our church family and as pastor preaches and as the different ones begin to come to the pulpit and cast the vision there's a point that, that we choose whether or not that we're going to sign up and be a part of what God is doing. And I think pretty much everybody in this congregation has that attitude that says, I want to be a part of what uh, is being built for the name of the Lord in our community, in our region. But notice here, immediately Hiram... Um, receives the vision, he understands it, he says, 
I'm on board with it. And then what does he do? He turns his attention, just as Solomon did, to actually doing the work of the vision. <coughs> and now have I sent you a cunning man and dude with understanding of Huron, my father, the son of a man of the daughters of Dan, and his father was a man of Tyre, skillful to work in gold and silver and brass and iron and stone and timber and purple and blue and fine linen, crimson, also to grave any manner of graving and to find out every device which shall be put to him with thy cunning men and with thy, the cunning men of my Lord David, thy father. Now therefore the wheat and the barley, the oil and the wine, which my Lord has spoken of, let us send unto his servants. He's like, let's do this thing. Verse 16, and we will cut wood out of Lebanon as much as thou shalt need. We'll bring it to thee in floats by sea to Joppa. You'll carry it to Jerusalem. And Solomon numbered all the strangers that were in his land of Israel after the numbering wherewith David his father had numbered them. There were found 150,000 and 3,600, and he set threescore and 10,000 to be bearers of burden, and fourscore thousand to be hearers in the mountain, and 3,600 overseers to set the people a work. And so I want you to notice here with me that there was the talking about the vision, and then what came next? See, sometimes if we're not careful, we just come back on Sunday and we just talk about it some more. Right? right? We just talk about it some more. And uh, talk is, is good, but if we don't do something with what we're talking about, then talk becomes very cheap. Right. Okay? But Solomon said, hey, I'm willing to back up my vision with money. Basically, he was saying, I'll pay these guys, whoever you have that can help me. I will do whatever I have to do. Uh, to make sure that it's taken care of and hear him said on his end, hey, I'll do everything that's needed. I know where to get the timber. I know the guys to get it out of the woods and to get it on the boats and to get it on the barges and to get it sent back upstream uh, to where it can be delivered for the building of this great temple. But what stood out to me, I'll tell you what, like the Lord is shining upon me with his favor right now through that back window. I can't even see you right now. So it's that time of year when the sun's going to I'll come in on us right here about this time of Bible lesson. Uh, but anyway, um, what I noticed here today as I was reading these verses, and I know I read a lot of verses for you, but I noticed that there are twice as many verses about implementation as there are about vision. The purpose of the vision, as the Lord told the prophet Habakkuk in his writing, is that he may run that readeth it. We must write the vision and make it plain. That's what he told the prophet to do. But why do we have the vision in the first place? He said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables. Why? That he may run that readeth it. Right. It's so that we can get a hold of God's purpose and begin to run with the vision that God has given us. It is necessary it is necessary uh, for each person in the church to get their own vision within the vision, so to speak. When I was talking about getting your own vision within the vision, I'm talking about your part of the implementation within the vision, the vision, the grand vision being the overall goal and plan that God has given us to reach our community. So in other words, each one of us has to ask ourselves, how do I run with this word from God? What can I do from the time that I receive the vision until the manifestation of the promise to facilitate the implementation of the vision? How can I demonstrate faith in the word of God that has been declared to me? 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, and I don't know if it's going to do anything for you, but it sure did a lot for me. This is how the vision gets implemented. And King Solomon sent and fetched Hiram out of Tyre. He was a widow's son of the tribe of Naphtali, and his father was a man of Tyre, a worker in brass, and he was filled with wisdom and understanding and cunning to work all works in brass. And he came to King Solomon and wrought all his work. Hiram did all that fancy stuff that all the people came in and saw in the temple. temple. If you read the rest of that chapter, I believe it's from verse uh, 15 down through 39, it details how the Hiram did all the engravings, all the gold overlays, 
everything that was beautiful and ornate in the temple, guess who did it? Hiram did it. And he wasn't anybody that uh, probably ever, when he was growing up and was learning his craft, he never realized that one day he was going to be used to build uh, and to furnish the temple for the one true God. As far as others were concerned, he was just Hiram, the engraver that just did. But God gave him a skill set for a greater purpose. And God has given each of us skill, understanding, talents, abilities, and he's waiting for us to be aligned with his purpose for our life, uh, that we would grasp the vision of what even little things that we can do, minute things that we can do. Minute things can be beautiful things. If you don't believe that, then go, uh, go look at that grain of rice. Have you ever seen that where there's a little grain of rice that they've done an engraving on? You have to hold it up real close. You use a magnifying glass. It's like, wow, I can't believe they did that on a grain of rice, but that sure is beautiful. Well, my little part in the kingdom of God, God wants that to be beautiful. He wants it to fulfill his purpose. And this is what Hiram did, and that's what he was really made for, what his talents were given to him for, was to do something greater and to do something for God that he had never imagined in all of his life that he would be selected to do. And it said he came to King Solomon and wrought all his work. But here's the kicker. If you read in a parallel account of this story, in, it's in one of the books of the Chronicles. You know what it says? It talks about all of these things, all the utensils, all the golden, all the pillars, and all the engravings, and all this stuff that we just read, or that if you take time to read verse 15 through 39, it says that Hiram did all these works. And it says in Chronicles, it says, and Solomon did all these things. Now here's the kicker. Whenever you've done your work for God, when you've done your part, you think people are going to say, wow, look what you did. Do you think that they're going to say, they're going to finally recognize your abilities and the whole world's going to know, man, Ben is such a talented person and he is such a great asset to the kingdom of God. Look what Ben did. No, they're going to say, boy, that Pastor Marty over there in Puxico, isn't he a great pastor? Isn't he doing a great job? Or they might not even say that. They might say, I'll tell you what, nobody ever thought there could be a church in that little town of Puxico, but the Missouri district leadership, they, uh, they saw fit to let someone go in there and start a work, and they support, and isn't Brother Parkey great? And isn't, don't we have great leaders? We do. But the truth was that little old Hiram did all that, and if it wasn't for this one reference, we had never known what all he did because when the people walked into the temple at the dedication, they didn't say, man, where's Hiram at that did all this stuff? We want to give him an award. No, they said, oh, King Solomon, he's the greatest king. Isn't he wonderful? So after you do your part within the vision, guess who's going to get the credit? Well, I don't know, but it probably won't be you. And guess what? You have to be okay with that in order to accomplish great things for God. Hiram did great things. He made just about everything that people would see when they came into the temple. He made the furniture, the utensils, the labors of brass, and the shovels, and the basins that the priests and the Levites were going to use in the ministry of the temple. But when it was all said and done, and the people walked in and beheld the beauty that he'd worked so hard to produce, they said, wow, look what Solomon did has done. They didn't say thank God for Hiram. We wouldn't have any of this without him. They didn't say thank God for King Urim even for sending this skilled man to help Solomon. They just said look what Solomon has done. But this is the lesson that we've all got to learn in the kingdom of God. It's not about who gets the credit. It's about the purpose. Why we do what we do. Right. 
is so that God will be glorified through our efforts. We'll close with this. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. And Isaiah 58 and 8 says, The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. The glory of the Lord. The fact that God is glorified through what we do. That's our reward. Is that we accomplished our mission. We did what we were called to do. And we're going to stand before him one day. And we want to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Doesn't matter if anybody ever knows what you did for the kingdom down here. But God knows what you're doing for him. And, um, you know, I think about those servants that carried the water pots when Jesus did the miracle. And they carried the water pots, they filled them up. And he said, it said, fill up all the water pots. And they filled them up to the brim. And then Jesus uh, turned that water into wine. And then the governor of the feast came and he drank of that wine. He marveled. He said, this is the best wine that we've ever drank. Oh, isn't this something? And the Bible says this, it says, and the governor of the feast knew not where that wine came from. He didn't know how the miracle happened. But then it says this, but the servants knew. Right. And when God is glorified through our efforts, here's our reward. We're going to know. Yeah where that wine came from. We're going to know where that product came from. We're going to know. It's not going to be a mystery to us. How was a church built in this community? How was this spiritual landscape changed in this region? We're going to know. Amen. Because we were a part of the miracle because we united our will with the purpose of God and allowed him to use us. In our morning devotion this morning, um, we talked about... um, Nehemiah, and when he was building the wall, there were people that were exploiting and and taking advantage of the situation. The enemies of God were were trying to come in and wreak havoc, and and he was just trying to do the will of God and all this, and he got a little frustrated. In Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 19, he said, Think upon me, my God, for good, according to all that I have done for this people. Think upon me, Lord. Lord, don't forget me. Don't forget everything that I'm doing. And and think on me because of the works that I have done for this people. And I thought about that. I thought, you know, we are so careful to say that we don't believe in a salvation of works, a works-based salvation. But then sometimes we act just the opposite. We think that we're somehow making ourselves worthy that we're earning our way, earning our keep. And the truth is that we could never actually be worthy of uh, the blood of Jesus. We could never be worthy to even be a part of his kingdom. But we are encouraged and admonished to walk worthy of the vocation. Everybody said the purpose. He said walk worthy of the vocation, Paul did to Timothy, to which you have been called. Amen. But at the end of the day, you know what our reward is going to be? Our reward is going to be that God was glorified in our efforts. That we made his name known. And that should be our goal. This is why we do what we do. Amen. Let's not forget that. Let's stand together. If we'll keep that in perspective, if we'll never be concerned with who gets the honor and the glory. um, But we point it towards God. You know, I I do believe the Word of God tells us that when we um, get those crowns, we're just going to cast them at His feet anyway, right? Because He is the one who is truly worthy. Amen. Why we do what we do, let's not forget it.